son, never fear. I am here to Captain Shouted. As he staggered down the hatch. <laughs> have a note here from somebody who says, Shepard, we have spent our last five years traveling the world looking for the worst bottle of beer that we can find. The worst. I mean, you know, most people spend their you know life looking for good things. But there, of course, there is a certain cult of uh, ugliness in our world today where people look for the worst. <laughs> and uh, many of us just get it without looking for it, actually, you know. But, uh, but uh, this uh, letter says we've uh, found the worst bottle of beer that uh, we have uh, uh, been able to determine uh, throughout the entire Western world. He says we did not get into the Far East. He says there must be some beauties over there. But uh, we finally uh, settled on this bottle of beer, and they sent a bottle of it to me. So uh, some night when I'm really, you know, when I'm in, in my mean mood, I'll sit down and open the bottle of the worst beer in the Western Hemisphere. What I ought to do is offer it to one of my friends. He say, hey, how about a beer, huh? <laughs> and uh, where do you think the worst bottle of beer was uh, made? No, no, no. Indiana Harbor, Indiana's close. There's a beer out there that they claim is made from the waters of the totally mucked up Calumet River. Uh, that's uh, just a rumor, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a green beer, as a matter of fact. And often, uh, opening up a bottle of that beer out there, it's not at all unusual to find a small dead pollywog, maybe a you know, snail or something in it, because uh, it does come, you know, it's from the waters of the sparkling Minnetonka. <laughs> I don't know whether you've seen the Minnetonka lately. <laughs> I'll tell you this, you wouldn't want to swim in it. Where do you think the worst bottle of beer was made, though, according to these guys? Well, I'll tell you, Costa Rica. He says, uh, it's a terrible bottle of beer. He says, in fact, when they were there, they didn't even see anybody drinking it. He says, so bad that, that the natives there wouldn't drink it. He says, it was just bad news. He said, however, he did see one guy drinking this beer. The only guy he saw was at a cockfight there. And uh, it says it was a real raunchy evening all the way down the line. You know, the walls were sweating and the cops were running around outside and fights were breaking out. And he said, this guy was drinking a bottle of this unbelievably bad beer. <laughs> so I just thought you ought to know that's the kind of listener we got. You know, it's obviously not the Johnny Carson crowd, right? And certainly not the Mike Douglas crowd. Oh, hi, Mike. Oh, he's so cute. It, uh, it's a whole different ball game. So, uh, would you please give the worst beer in the world a little cheer there, James, please? Thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Boy, it takes a lot of courage to turn out a totally rotten product. Thank you, thank you. Oh, very good. Keep that. We may need that later on. You know, speaking of, uh, of beer, uh, I, uh, I must say, hey, good news, uh, speaking of beer. Our television show's coming back on the air in July, and it'll be on through October. So if you missed the famous beer show, which uh, caused a lot of talk around the country, uh, that's part of that series. It's about number three, I think. Beer, the mother of us all. Right, that's how it opens up. You know, speaking of uh, great beer, though, uh, the best beer I had ever, really, that I can recall. I'm not a beer freak. I really am not. I'm not, I'm not a beer cuckoo. Uh, not, not at all. I uh, little bourbon now and again, but not beer much. I'm beer, you know. Beer, to me, is for people who uh, who have just graduated from Pepsi and have not quite made it into the big leagues. <laughs> Jim's thinking about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, but one night, one night in the middle of, uh, in the middle of Nigeria, when the temperature was, was uh, hovering about 115 degrees. And that was nighttime temperature, let me tell you, in the daytime temperature. Oh, I'll tell you. All you had to do, you, you, know, you know the old expression of, uh, of uh, how you could take a, an egg and you could fry the egg on the sidewalk? You've heard that in the hot weather? It's nothing compared to Nigeria. Do you know that the, that the, that the chickens over there were laying hard-boiled eggs? That's how hot it was. Uh, and <laughs> you like that, huh? But it was, it was mean, I'll tell you. Uh, and I I, uh, I came into this place that was outside of a town uh, called Joss, J-O-S. And uh, that's right in the interior, man. I'm way in the interior. So was it hot. Uh, before we got there, it was hot. Uh, it was, uh, later on, when we got to Joss, which is up on a plateau, it got cool. But before that, it was hotter than the hinges of hell. And we stopped at a place, me and this guy that were in this car. And uh, it was just bad news. And uh, hot, and uh, we pulled into this place, and there were a couple of guys sitting in there. It was 
just you know a little place made out of logs and a couple of palm fronds and stuff and we got out of this uh, Land Rover and uh, even the Land Rover's tongue was hanging out and we uh, went into the went into this place see, and uh, they had the, the house was made entirely out of coca-cola signs uh, have you ever seen places like that <laughs> well this was made entirely out of coke signs and uh, we go in there I figured anything to drink you know I'm not even I'm not a coke fan at all I'm not but anything and uh, when you're in places like that you don't just stop and say give me a glass of water you, you have a glass of water and you're liable to wind up with no liver uh, everything else so I, I that's true so I, I just not uh, you know out of self uh, self-reservation so I walk in I said uh, she the guy said you want beer I said yeah I guess I had a look on the face of a guy that was really, you know, my tongue was hanging out. So he reaches down into this uh, Coke, you know, that's uh, kind of a bin they have with the ice floating around. And he didn't have Coke in there. He had this beer. So he hands me a bottle of beer. When you order a bottle of beer in Nigeria, buddy, you get a bottle that's roughly a quart. You've seen that over there, Jim? Yeah, that's right. Great big son of a gun. And, and uh, that's a serious bottle. He's give me a bottle of beer. You're set for the night. So uh, he gives me the bottle of beer, and it had a had a stone stopper on the top. Yeah, it was had a white, you know, this kind of white uh, topper that you see once in a while on some kind of wine bottles that has a clip over it, a little metal clip and so on. That's a, that's the way it came, see. And they used the bottles over again. So I get the bottle of beer. I figure, you know, it's got a white stopper, and obviously it must be flat. I figure, you know. <laughs> but no, I just, phew, and uh, I, I, I took the bottle of beer, and I poured it out into this uh, plastic cup that they gave me to drink it out of. And it was cold. It was actually cold. Uh, and, and when you're in a place where it's really tropical, man, you really you really appreciate anything that's cold. I mean, anything that's cold. Anything. Uh, and so this was cold. I couldn't believe it. And I poured this beer into the plastic cup. It was a green plastic cup uh, with a green plastic handle on it. And it had some ad on the side for some paint company or something. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I showed a guy with a paintbrush painting a house. So uh, I poured the, the beer into this thing, and it had a rather uh, reasonable head. It was uh, but a thicker head than we're used to. You know, we have our heads are very light and bubbly. This was kind of a head that looked a little bit like whipped cream or something. See, So I poured it out, and I took a taste of that beer. And at that point, I realized that uh, I can understand the beer mystique. I really can it tasted so great. So uh, me and this guy drank our quart of beer apiece and uh, got back in the Jeep. And uh, it was an hour and a half. We traveled on the wrong road. Uh, we didn't care. We, we traveled completely in the wrong direction, heading towards a town called Kano, which would have gotten us to a hell of a lot of trouble because there was a war going on there. <laughs> we didn't care. But it was really good beer. It was called Red Star Beer. You ever hear of it? You know, it's a big beer in Nigeria. I didn't think you can't get that at Atlantic City. No, they don't. They don't have it there. But uh, this is not a show about beer tonight, not at all. So uh, for those of you out there that are searchers for perfection, and you know when you search for something uh, totally rotten, you can also be searching for a form of perfection. Did you ever think about it that way? That uh, that uh, that something that is the worst of its kind is as rare as something that's the best of its kind, right? Would you please give me that uh, commercial that I brought in there? Just hold it. Up. Now, here's a commercial I'm playing just for you. This is not a commercial. Hold it. Hold it, Jim. Hold it, Jim. That's it. Now, this is, this is Stop it right there. I'll bet, I'll bet not one of you, unless you've traveled much in certain parts of the south and uh, certain parts of the far north, occasionally in places like uh, uh, Waterville, Maine. Yeah, just stop it right there. Just hold it there. I'll bet uh, you have never heard a chewing tobacco commercial. You just don't hear them in New York. Do you know that if you go down to, the, the, when you get down south of, I would say roughly, oh, Richmond, Virginia, as you travel down there and you go into uh, any place, like a, like a Howard Johnson or something, and they have a cigarette machine and they have a couple of cigars in the cigarette machine, they will also have tins of, uh, of snuff, usually Copenhagen snuff, <laughs> <laughs> and and they will also have uh, they will have chewing tobacco in the cigarette machines. You just don't see that in New York. And do you want to hear a chewing tobacco commercial? 
if you've never heard a goodie, every ball player chews, to, chews tobacco, or at least a lot of them. So hit the chewing tobacco. This is not a Tobacco's commercial. I'm just playing this so you can hear it. Selling brand. Choose best because it's double picked. <laughs> Taste best because it's double dipped. Double beach dip. Nut, beach nut. Chewing tobacco. America's largest selling brand. Beach nut is the most popular chewing tobacco in America because beach nut chews best and tastes best. You see, only beech nut is double picked for cleaner chewing, double dipped to give you longer lasting flavor. No other chewing tobacco chews so clean yes, and sir. tastes so good. Try beech nut chewing tobacco today. Beech nut, beech nut chewing tobacco, America's largest selling brand. Choose best because it's double picked. Tastes best <laughs> because it's double dipped. Beach nut, beach nut, chewing tobacco, America's largest selling brand. Patooey, patooey. <laughs> beach nut. Now, I, quick, as I'll, I'll test your Americana quotient. What are the names of some other very famous chewing tobaccos? That was beech nut, double dipped. What are some of the others? You mean you don't know? Why, well, there's some famous ones around. You've never heard of Red Man? You have ever seen it? It comes in a big, with a big Indian on the front. There's another one called Eight Hour Day. Yeah, Eight Hour Day. That's, you know, it's supposed to last a whole day. <laughs> and when you work in a steel mill, that's important. So they have one called Eight Hour Day. And then there's Navy Cut Plug. You never heard of that one? You've never heard of Apple Plug? Of course. Have you ever heard of, uh, of, uh, it's one that's, uh, do, 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 do. it's got a twist. It's a twist. Something twist. And the tobacco comes in a, like a quid and it's twisted. You've seen that? Yeah, you've seen it. Sure. You ever try it? You have? <laughs> well, that's the way I feel about it. Terrible. It's incredible. But uh, to those who like it, I mean, you can't, uh, you can't put it down. You know, that's the way it goes. Snuff. Have you ever tried snuff? Well, now that's supposed to be very elegant, you know. There's a there's been a resurgence of snuffery. Yes, there has been. And there's some elegant snuff places now popping out in New York. If you haven't got them in your hometown yet, there's a place on Madison Avenue that specializes in very elegant snuff and snuff boxes. And a lot of these very elegant account executives, you know, with the with the skinny ties and uh, the uh, the very skinny suits. They go in there and they buy themselves snuff. You can get all kinds of stuff. For example, you can get snuff that's uh, that's uh, nasturtium flavored. Yeah, it sounds bad, doesn't it? But you can get uh, snuff that's that uh, has attar of roses in it. You can get the snuff that uh, has elixir of peach. How about that one? Yes, and you can get apple blossom snuff, and you can get jasmine. That's good. Oh, that that'll cause a lot of excitement down in the copy department. You start using jasmine snuff, and wow, we almost anything's liable to happen. They <laughs> they have uh, yeah, and and they have these little elegant snuff boxes. And uh, one of the real ways to make real points in this town is by the products you use. Now, you know, the further out in the boonies you live, the more you think in terms of the old style uh, status symbols, like a Cadillac. A Cadillac is no longer a status symbol in New York at all. Hasn't been for a long time. Um, on the other hand, either is a Mercedes, you see, any longer. A, a status symbol, you see, is to have yourself a 37-speed Bulgarian bike. Now, there you got something going, see. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether it works or not. Uh, if, uh, oh, yes, I know, I know the prized possession of a guy that I know. He has a, uh, he has a, a, a Ukrainian wristwatch. Uh, keeps terrible time, but he, he's constantly, uh, Flashing his, his Ukrainian wristwatch, and it has these uh, these Russian figures on it instead of one, two, three. You know, he looks at the time. Always takes him fifteen minutes to figure out what time it is. Doesn't matter. His watch is always thirty minutes late anyway. So he looks at it and makes a big issue. Oh, uh, somebody always says, "Oh my God, it's a wonderful looking watch, Chucky." And he says, "Oh, yeah, this is something I picked up in the Ukraine," and uh, kind of nice little ploy. Uh, another uh, thing, to, of course, is, is the products you actually use. Now, if, uh, if you think that you're making real points by using gold-tipped Ramesses cigarettes, just the kind that, uh, uh, or Ramesses, do you prefer that, the Egyptian cigarettes with the ivory tip, 
uh, the kind that uh, uh, what famous detective always began by uh, taking out a, a uh, an elegant gold-tipped Ramesses cigarette that was a hand rolled for him in Cairo? Who was that? Not James Bond. This is a guy that uh, that Ian Fleming copied when he wrote James Bond. You know, this, the elegant uh, undercover agent that used nothing but the best. He was always uh, drinking Napoleon brandy, and he had these cigarettes. What were they? You know, what was this, the detective? Very famous detective. In fact, there was a television series based on him for a while. But it was far too elegant for the Canon fans. They couldn't understand that. You know, Canon just says, put him up, freeze! That's all he ever says. Plow! But uh, the, they, they, <laughs> you know, that's the, the extent of the dialogue. But uh, this, he used to take, take out these elegant... He had a valet, too, which I always think is really the ultimate in elegance. Don't you think so, Jim? I mean, to have a valet, certainly... I mean, you know, that, that adds so much to your life. I, I, uh, <laughs> I mean, it really is, you know. Lay out my socks, will you please, James? Uh, that's kind of nice. But uh, he had a valet. What was the uh, detective? Quick. And he lived in Manhattan. No, it was not Peter Nero. Peter Nero is a, is a uh, cheap jack violinist. Well, what, was, uh, what was his name? It was not Nero Wolf. nor was it... Uh, uh, it wasn't, uh, come on, it wasn't Sam Spade, no way. Sam Spade, very very subtle detective. <laughs> I mean, that is, the, the dialogue consisted of a big blonde walked in, I hit her in the gut and said, what do you want, baby? That's uh, Stan. Sam Spade was the direct lineal ancestor to a later detective who was written by whom? Uh, a detective who had the name of a... Uh, of a carpenter's, a piece of carpenter's equipment, is his name. Mike Hammer. And who wrote Mike Hammer? Who created Mike Hammer? Deathless prose. No way to kill it. That stuff was... <laughs> it's deathless. Who, who, who was it? And, uh, of course, this detective I'm talking about, this elegant detective who lived on, on uh, New York's fashionable east side, he also... Uh, he was always going out the first nights and things like that. He was always, he was always discovered... In his uh, in his study, where he had a uh, uh, a world renowned collection of uh, first folio Shakespeare, and uh, his, yes, his collection of uh, of rare South American butterflies too rivaled that of the New York Museum of Natural History, and uh, he was always very elegant, uh, and uh, he was always sitting there uh, when when uh, a message would come. He's in his study. He's uh, reading uh, rare volumes of of uh, Sanskrit prose, uh, Persian, usually Persian poets. He's reading this, and he's, he lights up this this uh, Egyptian cigarette that were flown into him, especially by this airline that did nothing but fly cigarettes to him, and uh, they were <laughs> they were gold tipped with actual fourteen karat gold leaf. By the way, this is truly elegant. And once in a while, he would offer a friend of his an ivory tipped one, which was a second rate, the real ivory, you see, and. Uh, he uh, he gets the message. A message arrives, and uh, at that moment he reaches over and he pulls the velvet rope next to him, summoning his valet. And his valet appears soundlessly. He's always waiting to be called. See, and he appears soundlessly, dressed in impeccable morning clothes or evening clothes, as, the t as it demands. And at that point, uh, our detective would say to his valet, "Would you uh, please?" Uh, uh, would you please lay out my uh, walking bags? Uh, the case is afoot. And uh, well, his walking bags, you know what a walking bag, those are those kind of knickers, see? And at that point, the case would begin. Who was this detective? Trey Legant. And he was, he was a, a formidable intellectual. Uh, and he pursued the criminals because of the chase of the game, uh, he was not a fighter for good or evil, but he was a. He, the chase was what got him. Who was it? Oh, ho, ho, ho. Yes. Hey, you know, speaking of uh, American culture, I had a very interesting experience the other day, and I'll report it just as it happened. And, and that, that really happened. Um, I, I was with a friend whose, whose uh, hobby is varmint spotting. 
You know what varmint spotting is? You ever do it? Well, when you, if you, if you uh, begin to open your eyes, really open your eyes when you ride in a car, many people don't. They, they stare straight ahead like they're mesmerized. Or they sit and they listen to the radio like they're mesmerized. In either case, their head's asleep. So uh, if, you, if you watch, as you drive around in your car, you will be able to see just driving. I'm talking about driving. It's a very interesting hobby because it's, it's something you don't do by actually going to do it. And in short, if you go to ski, you go to ski. Uh, and you, you make an effort to be where there is skiing. But in this case, the, the essence of this type of hobby is to never go someplace specifically to do it. In other words, it's, a, it's, it's part of what happens as you do it. It's like a found hobby. Now, to, to spot varmints from the car, just driving. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying drive up to Maine so that you can look for a bear or something. Uh, as you drive along, you see an animal. Well, that's a varmint. And to be able to identify it as what it is and to actually see it from the road, you'd be surprised at the number of kinds of animals. In fact, this, this person uh, has logged so far, keeps a log, incidentally, has logged 24 different kinds of animals seen from the car just driving along. Now, not kinds of birds, different types of birds, different species of animals. Now, how do you like that? Now, to, and now stop and think in your mind what you've seen, what kind of animals you've seen. Uh, you've probably seen a deer. You've probably seen uh, a rabbit. Uh, you've probably seen an occasional fox. Well, this person has logged three kinds of foxes. Not only uh, the usual, uh, the, the, the uh, common variety of, uh, what do they call it, the brown or common fox, there's the silver. Uh, she also spotted a magnificent red fox with the black ears, which is a, quite a rare animal these days. Uh, what other animals have you seen? A what? Groundhog? All right. Possum? Okay. Go ahead. Woodchuck? Skunk? Okay. Owl? That looks like an owl. A raccoon? A raccoon. All right, go ahead. That's Now you've got about eight. <laughs> You're just beginning. Now you've probably seen squirrels, right? Uh, you've probably seen a snake or two, correct? All right, now we're up to about ten. Go on. Now you get into the exotics. Well, I'll tell you what we spotted the other day. We're riding along a road. It's a fantastic sight. In all the time I've driven all over America, I've never seen anything like this. And I've been some wild places. For those of you who know my television show, you know that I've been in some pretty remote places, including north of the Arctic Circle and down in the Everglades, but I've never seen anything like this. And it just happened. Incidentally, that's one of the one of the things about varmint spotting, is that it happens when you least are ready for it, expect it. You you have to be very alert <laughs> because these a lot many of these animals that you see are very shy animals. They don't they don't just come and cross the road, you know, they don't they don't have a sign by the side of the road that says mink crossing. Uh, no way. <laughs> have you seen a mink? From the road. You have seen a mink. That's not a, a wild mink. is quite a rare creature. Uh, all right, you've seen a mink. Where'd you see it? Right here, New York? Upstate New York? Well, that's possible. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this was one of the most exotic things I've ever seen from the car, especially since this creature is usually a deep woods creature and is found... Uh, in places where it's not ordinary, you know, it's, it's, you gotta go and you have to be very careful because this is a very sensitive creature. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, we're driving along when all of a sudden, uh, right out, came right on the road. It was a two, two lane highway, divided highway with a median in between, you know, two lanes on each side, one going uh, one way, one going the other. When all of a sudden, crossing the other highway, coming towards us, but just almost directly even with the car, and then as we were going along, it was behind us, of course, were two magnificent, and don't tell me you've seen these, I know you haven't, two magnificent wild turkeys. That is a rare creature. 
Have you ever seen a wild turkey? Most people have never seen them. Now, I have never seen a wild turkey. I know that in certain parts of the country you can go and hunt them, and uh, it's difficult to, uh, to uh, you know, to find them. But here were two magnificent wild turkeys crossing the road this past week, and they were big, really beautiful, about yay high. Uh, the wild turkey does not look like the uh, the domestic turkey, but you know immediately it's a turkey. I mean, first of all, they're very slender. You know, the, the domestic turkey is a big, heavy-bodied creature. It's been bred for that, and uh, it's squat, and wide. You've seen you've seen many uh, you've seen domestic turkeys, but this is a totally different ball game. Have you ever seen uh, a bourbon called wild turkey bourbon? Okay, you know the label of it. That's a perfect picture of a wild turkey. That's exactly the way this looked. These two wild turkeys are tall and narrow, sort of a brownish, silverish, iridescent gray. Um, uh, oh, no way could you confuse this for, say, a pheasant. Totally different creature. They walk different and everything. The head is whipped, the big red head, you know, and everything hanging. Fantastic creature. And two of them right across the road. Now, now, uh, have you ever tried uh, any other... Have you ever... Tr- Taking up that hobby, it's a great hobby, really. Because, first of all, it gives you a lot to do when you're driving. If you're driving long distances, you'd be surprised practically every trip. If you take a trip of any length of uh, driving, you're going to see some kind of animal from the road. If you watch, you have to really watch. Many of them are highly camouflaged. And uh, you'll see a a creature just uh, there by the side of the road or going across the road or usually uh, moving parallel to the road. Generally, they're moving parallel. One of the greatest creatures I think I've ever seen from the car, just driving, was a magnificent, and I mean truly magnificent, a just fantastic creature, uh, was, a, was a giant western elk. Now, this was the very rare creature. It's an endangered species, and this is a biggie. Wow. He must have had uh, antlers on him that probably were five or six feet across, and I mean like 10, 12 points, tremendous head of, of uh, antlers. And he was walking right next to the road where I was driving. This is a, a creature that's uh, found out west. Incidentally, there's also some of them found in northern areas, up in northern New York State, I believe. Or am I wrong on that? I think there are some. Uh, but this elk was a beautiful creature, and uh, he was walking along parallel to us, but below us in a gully, just walking along. Didn't didn't notice us at all. Tremendous animal. And we uh, slowed up and watched that guy for about, oh, about ten minutes. He just walking along very deliberately. And then he moved off into the woods. A fantastic creature. One of the other, I'll tell you, the most fantastic moment I've ever had, though, driving in a car, looking at animals. And it was kind of scary. <laughs> this was a scary moment. And uh, it uh, really, I, I, I never can forget it because it was so dramatic. Yeah, that's right, Bob. A bobcat, that's right, Jim. A bobcat. Did, where'd you see him? Up New York State? Yeah, bobcat. Uh, dead animals don't count. Uh, well, you know, you'll see an animal that's been hit by a car occasionally, and uh, that doesn't count. I, Although I've seen some weirdos, uh, I remember... Not too long ago, seeing a dead cougar beside the road. Now, there's something to see. Yep, it was a it was a fairly young cougar, but it was dead, sure dead. And uh, apparently, somebody had come along and uh, popped him, and there he was, all all there he was, D E D dead. But uh, probably the greatest experience I've ever had in uh, seeing an animal from the car, and it doesn't have anything to do with Africa, because in Africa, remember. You go out with that purpose. You, you, you drive out into the bush and you, you look at animals, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the accidental encounter of an animal. And uh, it was a very strange trip I was taking. And uh, the trip, uh, it was midwinter, which made it even eerier uh, for the one reason or another. Well, it was close to midwinter, not quite close to midwinter. And uh, the reason I'm telling you about the time of the year, because that plays a role in it, that uh, it began at Innsbruck. Now, Innsbruck is in uh, Austria, and it's uh, it's just over the mountains uh, from Germany. Germany, uh, the mountains go right through 
right began at Innsbruck, as a matter of fact, and that's why it's a big skiing community. There's a lot of skiing in Innsbruck. But uh, Innsbruck is a fascinating town. It's sort of half medieval and half uh, opera ski. On the one end, uh, you got all the elegant tourists with the two-way stretch everything. And uh, you know, on the other end of town, you have uh, these medieval, <laughs> it's, it's really medieval it's arches and enclosed uh, uh, cathedrals and fascinating place. Well, I was, I was on my way that particular night to Munich. Now, to, to go to Munich from uh, Innsbruck, you have to go uh, through the mountains. And it was uh, dark, absolutely sp stygian darkness. I shouldn't have really done what I did, but I did it. I had to go there. I had a time schedule, and I had to go to Munich. Well, it's a trip about, really, it's only about, uh, normally, it's a trip of about three and a half, four hours. And you go through this high mountain pass, and you, you pass as you go, come down on the German side, and you, you're really up there. You're up in the, in the high mountains now, the Bavarian Alps, and uh, it's, it's cold, I mean bitter cold, and they have avalanches and they have problems with uh, great snowfalls in which you can really get yourself in terrible trouble. But I had to go, so I did, and I took off, and of all things, I'm driving this tiny German car, uh, which uh, you could have put into the trunk of a Volkswagen. This was a Gogo mobile. It's a little tiny car with uh, with about a well, oh, probably a U.S. horsepower, about a thirty horsepower engine, and uh, it's a tiny glass enclosed little machine with very minimal heating uh, facilities in it, if any, and a tiny radio uh, that was terrible. And so I began. I was driving by myself, and I drove out of Innsbruck, and just at twilight, and it immediately got dark. It was winter. And I drove along the river there for a while. It comes into Innsbruck. Beautiful country, but it was dark by now. And I started to climb in the um, mountains and up towards the pass. And absolutely nobody else on the road, just me and that car with very dim lights. That was another thing that made it uh, difficult. These lights were terrible. And I could see these dark forests on either side. So we started to climb, climbing higher and higher. And then just as I hit uh, the peak, and I'm, I'm leveling off and starting to and went through the pass, I'm over in the German side now, I'm approaching a town called Mittenwald, which means middle of the forest, literally. And it's a tiny town that looks like elves built it. It does, it really does. It looks like elves built little stained glass windows and little uh, golden stained uh, doorways. And it's a tiny town, little cobblestone street, and I'm just about to get into Mittenwald. I can almost see the lights when suddenly, right out in the middle of the road, stopped me dead. I stopped the car. I couldn't couldn't go any further. He was right in the middle of the road. It was a gigantic red Bavarian stag. Fantastic creature. Now this thing looked like about the size of a moose. It was a red stag. You've heard the uh, uh, the giant European red deer. Quite rare. Very rare, as a matter of fact with an enormous head of uh, antlers, but red, absolutely red, tremendous. And he just stood and watched me, stopped me. And we were about six feet apart. He just looked in the front window of that, of that car at me. We sat there for about five minutes. He didn't move, just looking at me. And then he slowly turned and began to trot right down the middle of this narrow road through the forest, right ahead of me, five, six feet ahead of the hood. He just trotted. I could hear his, his, his hoofs or his feet, whatever they had, <laughs> hitting the ground ahead of me. And he, he was, well, his hind quarters, to give you an idea how big he was, his hind quarters were as high as the top of the car. That's a lot of animal, buddy. And he just trotted along ahead of me. We went about a half a mile that way, and then he just melted into the forest. And I just turned the corner like through the woods, and I was right in the middle of Mittenwald possible to believe what I saw. Hello, I'm Oscar Brand, and I'm a traveler on tape. All over this country, in the gray dust of large cities, each week, on Voices in the Wind. Hear Voices in the Wind, Sunday at 5.30 on WBJC.